I've got some guests in with me today, Peter Hurd, Adele Cosgrove Bray and Tim Hume from Riverside Writers who meet every month at the West Kirby Library. I went to one of their meetings last week, we had a really good fun, it was a good laugh, it was good fun wasn't it? We always aim to make the meetings yeah. fun rather than serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had an email in about uh, Peter's short story, it's from Barry and Sheila and they say uh, we re- should, they really enjoy these writing features we have on the radio. And they said, your stories are very good, Raymond Chandler spoof, very funny. Oh, thank you very much. Which is nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Now, Adele, you're our dark fantasy writer. I am, you? I am. I mean, before I met you, I thought all fairies were, uh, were all nice and cuddly and sweet. And Oh, uh, no. How you... wrong? Very wrong. If you read old Celtic folklore, you'd know that fairies are not cuddly and sweet. They are tall, they're very, very clever, and they can be extremely vicious as well. So you, you've blown away all my fantasies, my innocence. But is I've all given gone. you new ones, better ones. <laughs> <laughs> you write dark fantasy. Could you yeah. just explain maybe if people don't understand what it is? Because it sounds a bit, oh. Well, fantasy, dark fantasy and horror, they do overlap quite closely. Dark fantasy tends to be, to simplify it completely, less gory than horror, more gothic, more atmospheric, and it's more sombre than straightforward fantasy that can be just swords and sorcery. It's not really what I do. Mm. Are you mainly a short story writer but, or, or novelist? Both, actually. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you've had quite a lot of stuff published, haven't you? I've had some short stories published and quite a bit of poetry. I don't really write poetry very much anymore. I've got more into my fiction. But mm. yes, I've write, I'm currently writing my third novel, in a series of dark fantasy stories set on Wirral in Liverpool. Fantastic. It's great that um, it's set locally as well. Well, I like to write what I know, and I live here, and I love the area, and I base everything here, really. Brilliant. And what what short story have you got for us now? Today I've got a story for you called Swap. Now, if you've ever been to Park Gate, you'll have stood on the low harbour wall and marvelled at the view, where sand and the tidal river Dee ought to be is an undulating expanse of marsh grass and reeds. Now, science tells us that it's due to a gradual build-up of estuary mud, but I want you to forget all that hocus-pocus. This is the true story of what really happened at Park Gate. Are you ready? Go on. Swap. Tell me a story. It's late. I want a story, a real one, with fairies. Pamela tenderly brushed the child's sandy fringe away from her sleepy eyes and said, We're going to Park Gate tomorrow. Get some sleep. I'm not tired. She smiled at her niece's defiance. No? Ah, well, perhaps just a short story. The little body wriggled beneath the warm duvet, the child's face glowing with satisfaction having won her own way. Were all four-year-olds this willful? Pamela resigned herself to perching on the edge of the narrow bed. These few golden hours would soon be consigned to history once Pamela's sister and brother-in-law returned from their trip. Rosie was noisy and exhausting, and she'd got the house in a mess, but this small child seemed to bring the place to life. Pamela was aware of Rosie's pink and white face staring up at her expectantly. How shall I begin? With once upon a time, stupid. Pamela smiled indulgently at this tyrannical cherub clad in pink crumpled pyjamas. OK, have it your own way. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, There lived a beautiful young girl. Was she a princess? Don't interrupt. No, she wasn't a princess. My daddy says all little girls are princesses. Pamela smirked. I'm sure he's right. But if everyone was a princess, then that would be quite normal, wouldn't it? And not being a princess is what made this girl special. Rosie wrinkled her button nose in contempt. This story sounds silly. Don't you want to hear it, then? Rosie sighed heavily, then gave a melodramatic shrug. Pamela chuckled, leaning her weight on one arm. Where was I? A long time ago there lived a girl who wasn't a princess like all the other little girls, and she lived in a cottage by the harbour. Not in a castle? No, only princesses live in castles, and she wasn't a princess. Why? Did this child ever ask anything else? Why this, why that, all day long? It was exhausting, yet oddly amusing. Rosie's endless questions had forced Pamela to realise that she, too, didn't really know the why of an unnerving number of things. Were all children so inquisitive? 
Pamela rolled her eyes and replied, Princesses have to have mums and dads who are kings and queens. This girl's mother was a weaver. Her father was a fisherman whose blue boat was docked in the harbour when it wasn't out at sea. What's a name? You've not said a name. Ivy, said Pamela, using the first name which came into her head. Rosie scowled. My mum and dad aren't kings or queens, but my daddy says I'm his princess, and my best friend Susan is a princess too, and her mummy is a telesales operator. Yes, well, perhaps there are different kinds of princesses. Anyway, Ivy lived in a small cottage by the harbour, and when her dad's blue boat came back from the sea, ships go out to sea, not boats. Boats only go on rivers. Well, perhaps this one changed its mind. Pamela had the horrible feeling that the little monster might be right. She quickly rushed on. So when Ivy's father came back from fishing out at sea, Ivy would stop helping her mother with the weaving. What's weaving? Pamela paused. How could Rosie recognise the differences between boats and ships, but not understand weaving? She struggled for a simple explanation. Weaving is when strands of cotton or wool are threaded through each other to make cloth. Rosie scowled again. What for? So the cloth could be made into clothes. Didn't they have shops? No, not in those days. Pamela hoped the child wouldn't notice her lie. How did Ivy's daddy buy a ship then? He swapped it for some fish. Oh, can we get on with the story now? Who did it swap it with? Rosie! How can I tell you the story if you keep interrupting all the time? Pamela tried and failed to look stern. Rosie sat up in bed, shoving her pillow behind her as she leaned against the soft headboard. A silky hair stuck up at the back. Did he sell fish on eBay? Pamela burst out laughing. No, computers hadn't been invented yet. Rosie stared round-eyed. Perhaps Pamela had once worn a similar expression when her great-grandparents had talked about life before motor cars. Pamela tried to regain control of the story. Ivy's father swapped a big pile of fish for the blue ship. He made this swap with a fairy. I don't mean a tiny fairy in a tutu with see-through wings and a wand with a twinkling star on top. They're just make-believe. I mean a real fairy, one of the old Celtic gods who were tall and powerful and who knew real magic. Rosie's petulant expression eased a little. Obviously the mention of fairies and magic had hit the right spot. Pamela adjusted her position on the duvet. The swap seemed to go well. Ivy's father and the handsome fairy shook hands on the deal before going their separate ways. But the fairy's walk home took too much, too much time now he didn't have his ship. Normally the fairy would have sailed up the River Dee, then moored, bo moored his boat by the shore. But now, by the time he'd walked all the way home, the fish had begun to smell. Didn't he live in fairyland? No, I told you, all that's just made up. The fairies lived on Coldy Hill. It's quite a long walk from Ivy's home in Parkgate to the fairies' home in Coldy, and it had been a very hot day. Fish soon go off, you know. Couldn't he have done a magic spell to stop the smell? Rosie folded her arms around her knees and tried to hide a yawn. Perhaps he forgot, said Sir Pamela. Anyway... His wife wouldn't let him inside the home until he got rid of the strong fishy smell, which made him really cross, and he accused Ivy's father of giving him a bad fish. This was unfair, but people often are. He tried offering the smelly fish back to Ivy's father in return for the blue ship, but Ivy's father refused, saying, Gentlemen, never go back on a deal. The fairy angrily declared that since bad fish were of no use to him, then the blue ship should be of no use also. And so the spiteful fairy cast a powerful magic, magic spell and never again did the ocean tide return to Park Gate. Rosie yawned widely and covered her nose with her hand. She quickly adjusted its position. Then she abruptly thrashed under the duvet and flopped down against the mattress, pulling the pillow back under her tussled head. That's a stupid story. It's not even a bit scary. That's not my fault. It's just the way it came out. Stories don't always do what you expect them to. But when we go to Parkgate tomorrow, you'll see the empty harbour for yourself. You'll not see the sea because it never came back. The fairy's magic sent it away. What's there instead? Rosie's eyes were already closing. Marsh grass and reeds mostly. Now go to sleep. It's far past bedtime for little girls, even little princesses. 
Pamela rose and moved towards the bedroom door, her hand already reaching to turn the light off. Rosie was probably right, it had been a silly story. The child's mind was as sharp as the edge of new cartridge paper, but Pamela loved Rosie's insatiable curiosity and acute, if naive, logic. If fairies had still lived on Caldy Hill, Rosie's family would have had to remain on constant alert to prevent them from stealing her away and swapping her for a changeling. Pamela slowly made her way downstairs. There was some wine in the fridge. How might it feel to have a child of her own? It was a pity she couldn't do a swap with a fairy man. Imagine it. A pile of fish in exchange for a child. It sounded like a fair deal to her. She'd be sprinting towards the harbour immediately, if it was possible, fishing rod in hand. She sniffed the wine bottle to test for any vinegary smell. It seemed okay, but the fridge smelled of haddock. That was ridiculous. She'd not bought any. Pamela laughed quietly and silently mocked herself for allowing her imagination to run unchecked. If she believed her own senses, then the entire house reeked of fish. And that's all she could tell anyone when later cross-examined. Her guest room had been found full of decomposing fish. There was no trace of little Rosie. Oh, you scare me, Adele. <coughs> hey, that's one of my lighter stories. <laughs> you come across as all nice and sort of well brought up and... <laughs> not, as, not as nice as you think really <laughs> as writers now Adele, Tim and Peter as writers where do we get our motivations and our ideas from do you think a lot, a lot from well in my case a lot from experience sorry uh, a lot from experience um, sort of things that have happened little things that have happened o- over my life which uh, Say a slot together with other ideas. Mm. Mm. Peter, what about you? Where do you get the ideas for your stories from? Experience, definitely. But um, I think it could be could be anywhere. To be quite honest, you could see something walking down the street that kind of you might um, might spark off something imaginative in your mind, um, or read something. Mm. A lot of write- writers keep a journal, don't they, of sort of things that they observe, maybe read in the newspaper, you sit on the bus, you meet some weird people. Does anyone... Because I keep a journal for my writing, not, so... Not a journal, anyone... but yeah. scraps of paper litter my house. Yeah. I kind of just... <laughs> That's just being yeah. bad at housekeeping. Probably, yeah. yes. <laughs> Adele, how about you? I'm bad at housekeeping too. <laughs> <laughs> don't bother with it. So, I mean, you're... you're I, mean, I know... Um, You know, fiction is fiction no matter what Mm. genre it is, but dark fantasy, it's a little bit different, isn't it? I draw on personal experience um, and also folklore. I've read folklore since I was a child and I've seen ghosts and strange things that other people think of figments of my imagination that Mm. I've seen. And I weave all this into my stories, but I get ideas from all over the place constantly. Even a flippant little remark that a passing stranger might say that just catches my imagination for some mm. odd reason. I can turn that into a story. Mm. You're listening to Seven Waves Community Radio 92.1 Live. 